You're listening to Music Tectonics. We interrupt this episode of the Music Tectonics podcast as some news has just broken about our guest, uh, Boomi's Alex Mitchell. Music Business Worldwide reports that the AI music app has created 14 million tracks to date, and Spotify just deleted a bunch of its uploads after detecting, quote, stream manipulation. Check out Music Business Worldwide to see that story, which was published on May 3rd. My interview today with Alex Mitchell was actually recorded back in April, almost a month ago, and and uh, it brings up the idea uh, that people that are in the AI music world should uh, consider how they want to tell their story. And our Music Tectonics co-host, Tristra New Year Yeager and Marketing Director of Rock, Paper, Scissors, Eleanor Rust, did a podcast back on February 28th called Why AI Innovators Need to Speak Human with Rock, Paper, Scissors PR. You can check out that podcast, but also go to the rockpaperscissors.biz website. Under Resources, you can scroll down to Downloads, and we have a download there as well called Why AI Innovators Need to Speak Human Lessons from Rock, Paper, Scissors PR. The interview that we have is great, but just wanted to give you a little bit of context since some new news has broken about Boomi and its relationship with Spotify and its distributor. And uh, we just wanted to make sure that this interview wasn't listened to without that context. It's still a great interview. And if you've just learned about Boomi through the news this week, this is a great chance to do a deep dive. Check out my interview with Alex Mitchell. Welcome back to Music Tectonics, where we go beneath the surface of music and tech. I'm your host, Dimitri Vitsa. I'm also the founder and CEO of Rock, Paper, Scissors, the PR firm that specializes in music tech and innovation. And those of you who have been with us since we launched this podcast in 2019, maybe even earlier in 2018, you came to the first Music Tectonics conference uh, in LA. That was the year of the fires. We had brush fires and we immediately had to move to another venue downtown. And we did some crazy stuff because we wanted to make Music Tectonics stand out as something different that was than what was already out there. And we had our blockchain cage match that year, which was insane, got a little bit out of control. And we had AI's Got Talent. And the whole idea, this was close to five years ago, was to say, hey, there's some cool stuff happening with AI and music. But you wouldn't know it until you started reading the news in 2023 when AI has just blown up. One of the folks that was on AI's Got Talent was our guest today. It's Alex Mitchell, the founder of Boomi. Alex, how you doing? Great. Um, Not on fire, unlike last time. (laughs) You you did an amazing job there, by the way. Thank you. I I remember flying in on the plane and seeing the fires, and I have a basic understanding of LA geography. And I was like, that looks like the hotel we're supposed to be at over there. Um, yeah, it was kind of and a I touch was and amazed go. by your ability to, to, to pivot that like, yeah, bravo. Our, our marketing director, um, Eleanor Rust is always a little worried about the name we gave the conference music tectonics. And we talk about seismic shifts and we're like, let's be careful with how much. Oh, uh, oh I never even thought of that. <laughs> how yeah. much we talk Oof. about that stuff. That are... You are setting yourself up for one really awkward year, yeah. potentially. <laughs> no, no, it's not going to happen. Alex, you are, as I said, <laughs> the founder and CEO at Boomi. Before that, I rem- I met you when you were at AudioKite. You, you created something mm-hmm. else, um, a really different product, and ended up uh, selling that to Reverb Nation, which has since then yeah, been yeah. sold as well to, to, to band lab. So who knows where Someone, your, someone's got it where somewhere. Your code yeah. and data is <laughs> out there in the music tech landscape. Um, but that's cool. It's, I mean, it was kind of interesting to me that you made such a big switch from, uh, audio kite, which was really, um, really like it to me had a lot of, of data components to it, to this part where you're actually in this music creation world. <laughs> well, it, it, it was actually pretty natural. Um, I only learned about, you know, what AI music, what, I mean, you, you know, my background, I mean, I'm, I'm a musician, right. Okay. Um, and, and I produce a bunch of artists and I used to stand on street quarters and play violin. And I only learned about this thing that we'll call AI music that I won't cringe at that term yet. <laughs> uh, let's call it generative, right? This, this idea of generative music or this idea of AI music, um, I only became aware of because uh, s- some of those researchers, some of those uh, people were our, cl- our clients, mm. right? Uh, they were using this to test, uh, Audio Kite would market test music. 
uh, to market test their their outputs. Like, hey, how does this compare to you know the the non AI music or the non gendered music out there? And I saw some of these systems, and I think I, I had the moment that a lot of people are having now. And this was like a this was a while ago, where as somebody who loves making music, as somebody who loves musicians, uh, who really cares about human artists, it, I, I saw, you know, the first time I saw a song that could come out of, you know, uh, a really clever set of algorithms, it was sort of this moment of, well, this is what everything's going to be. And I don't know when, but this is how it's going to go. And so after, as we were looking at new, new things to do, it, it was actually pretty natural. It was a pretty natural transition. That is so uh, I'm glad cool. we did, because it seems like that time is now. That is really cool. I mean, you know, at Rock, Paper, Scissors and in Music Tectonics, a lot of our pursuits in mind particularly, and I think our team as well, is just following curiosity, like pulling on the thread and you keep pulling it and you see what, what comes. And it's so cool to hear. I just assumed that it was some kind of leap or some kind of identity shift. So it's really cool to see that it actually came out, that Boomi actually came out of lessons learned um, from your previous startup. Let's explain how Boomi works to our listeners first. How do you describe it to someone you've just met? Let's say it's someone who's not into AI or tech, but someone who just likes music. Maybe they dabble on the sure. gu guitar, they've DJed in college. How would you describe it to them? Well, I'd, I'd probably say we're a, uh, we're a team of soulless robots. Uh, we've been <laughs> sent here uh, from a far off planet to end the happiness and delight of humanity. Uh, and the best way we could think of doing that is by re replacing all the human musicians. Um, I'm kidding. But <laughs> but a lot of the times when people ask me <laughs> what Boomy's doing, they've come to the table with that. Uh, no, we, we how, how would I describe Boomy to a stranger? We, we are, we are a, a company that builds generative music technologies. Uh, and most people would know us from our platform at boomy.com where anyone, uh, regardless of skill level, uh, or any background or any access to, to resources, so long as they have any device connected to the internet, uh, can start making music, uh, with, with, you know, AI powered or AI assisted systems. Um, and if they like what they make, if they like what they hear, they can release it, uh, through boomy's, you know, record label and publisher. Uh, out into the world. You know, what this means is you can, uh, you know, go from never having made a song in your whole life uh, or even thought about making a song to seeing yourself, you know, and the thing that you made uh, on Spotify in in days, right? Not not years. Um, so so I think that's how I would explain it. it. And and then the conversation goes, well, what would I make a song about? And it says, well, here's what people are doing, right? Uh, we've got parents and kids who are making, you know, songs that are about uh, uh, things that matter to them, right? Uh, we've got people who are, you know, making a song for your car ride, making a song for, you know, your specific uh, routine. We there's an emerging case in like therapy, almost. People make it as this this relaxing, fun activity. We had a lot of people in the pandemic, uh, you know, show up just to say like, this is just a fun way to, uh, you know, pass time and uh, make something, and then I can put it on Spotify. I can share with my friends. So it's, it's really for people who, who want to be musicians. Um, and, and that, that's probably, I would just say, yeah. And, and if you've dabbled, right. If you've dabbled in playing guitar, if you've dabbled in, in DJing, you know, how much time and effort and, and, you know, uh, how the difficulty, right. Mm, yeah. Of not just producing something all the way to the end, but the sort of like, should I put this out? Is this good enough? Right. It, do I really, you know, is, are people going to judge me? And I think one of the, the nuggets that we've seen is that when you're co-creating with a system like this, you have this sort of like shamelessness. It's like, yeah, I made this. It's about this thing. And it, you know, it's fun here, right? Uh, go listen to it and go have fun with it. Um, and then, of course, we've seen, you know, so many artists and so many people from the, let's call it more, more traditional music creation uh, uh, community you know, show up with amazing ideas and, and build great stuff. And uh, it, it really is, you know, starting to build us out uh, as as a record label and a publisher in, in every way that matters. Wow. You know, it's so cool to hear you describe it now because back in 2019 when you were at the Tectonics Conference, I remember having a conversation with you maybe right after the panel or, or something and getting the sense that what Boomi was going to be able to do was help people do for music what emojis did for text in a way you know like it felt like um 
social media, you, you would, you would basically go to Boomi and create something that was just sort of expressive of a mood or a vibe and put it on social media. And it would, it wouldn't feel as precious as, Oh, I've released an album. It would be more like, Hey, this is what I feel right now. I, I played around with this thing and created this thing. And, um, but that was then. And I actually got a chance to play with Boomi. I mean, anyone can. You go to boomi.com and you can set up the freemium account and start going. And I don't know how iterative this tech build is for you right now. Like, I want to kind of describe what my experience was like so that if people are listening and they haven't done it yet, honestly, it's so easy to do. But if you haven't done it yet, this is what it, this is what it feels like. Because I think part of the conversation is, well, are, am I making music or is it making music or are we making music? And I wasn't sure until I used it. And I'll tell you after I go through this how I feel about it now. But um, so you tell me if I've, if, if like what I'm saying now is about to change because I did this a little, you know, like a week ago or something. It might be best for me to show some of the music. When you go into it, though, you get a few options of styles. I saw electronic dance, rap beats, lo-fi, global groove and relaxing meditation and custom i didn't click on custom so i don't know what it was i think i selected oh, rap beats. The most fun oh really okay i gotta try that i started with rap beats and i got a series of i don't know sub styles there was shake your boomy haha boomy bap mahogany flex houseified icy r&b and roulette i did not try roulette actually for some reason i like the sound of mahogany flex so I picked that. I don't even know what it was. It just sounded cool. So then you see these celestial looking purple dots swirling around on the website. While, and by the way, this is all in the browser. You know, I haven't downloaded anything. And Boomi's supposedly composing. And then it says it's recording, recording your tracks. Um, and after the dots uh, take on this pinwheel looking pattern, like a bunch of drones performing a light show or something, you get a track and you've literally selected a style, a sub style. And from from there, you could like theoretically release it on tr on Spotify or something, right? <laughs> let you could submit it. I don't know that we would put it out oh, if you just oh, click one thing. But, oh, but let's, yeah, let's get to that in a minute. Here, let yeah, me let, to that. let me actually. I don't know how you're going to feel about this, Alex Mitchell, but I named my first song Mitchell's Return. Oh boy, kind of scary. Like someone's coming back. The bloody hatchet. <laughs> I can tell you didn't work on this much. What? <laughs> Man, I spent <laughs> over 10 minutes on this. <laughs> Did you add vocals to anything? Did not you... this one. Not this one. I'll do some. I'll, I'll show you some other ones. I don't think. Right. Yeah, pretty simple stuff. There's a lot more you can do for track customization, which really gives the user a chance to get more creative. You can change the tempo. You can influence the instruments, the mixes. There's effects. Um, but the cool, I mean, one of the, besides adding vocals, one of the cool features I liked was this drag and drop interface where you rearrange measures or riffs. I couldn't tell what they were. There's this cool graphical thing that looks like it could be measures, but it's, you don't have to read music. So you just see these little lines and stuff. Um, but you're, it's at that point, when you start doing that, you start to feel like you really are doing some kind of like songwriting or production. Um, but, uh, I was going to ask you about the boomy business model. We haven't talked about that yet, but now you just, you just mentioned I could submit it. What does that mean? I don't, I don't, I don't inherently get this on Spotify if I pay for it. Well, look, we're, we're going to give you, you know, the better for the doubt, but we have, let's talk about the things that have changed since 2019. Mm. Uh, in 2019, you know, we had a few thousand users. We're in, we're in the seven figures plus hundreds of thousands of users, you know, per month now. Whoa. And we are very, very conscious. Oh yeah. Uh, it's, it's only going up. Um, and we're very, very conscious about, about what we put out. We, we put out, we put human eyes on, on every release before it goes out. Um, we are, are conscious about, you know, not, not flooding, not being seen as, you know, putting out what I would call, uh, or what some might, might call low quality content or, or everything. Right. I, I, I think when you look at the realities of the distribution market, the realities, uh, of the notions, uh, that, that we're putting out there, you know, I, I don't know that every DSP wants every single song that's, that's coming out of this, uh, yet, uh, some of them do, some of them don't, we're, we're always in conversations about this. Um, but right now, yeah, we, we are definitely doing a, a layer of curation, right. Mm. As to what we're going to put out by default. Um, and some of that does have to do with effort. Uh, some mm -hmm. of that has to do with if, if you're just going to press a button, um, our, it's basically going to be up to our team, mm. whether or not we think that's, you know, that's, that's going to go out or not. Um, and so anybody could submit, right. 
And if you have, you know, worked on the song and if you've you, you made something that you're proud of and that we're like, yeah, that's cool. We're, we're going to put that out. Um, if you press a button and, you, you know, type in some random words uh, or, you know, God forbid you're, you're making something really offensive. Uh, believe me, in a user base this big, we see all kinds of stuff. Um, then we're, you're going to be able to speak with our team. And so actually probably what would happen if you release that right now or try to, is we would say, uh, respectfully, uh, Dimitri, this is a little bit of a generic song. <laughs> uh, we have a generic release policy oh, wow. and let's make it about something. Let's make it, you know, let's, let's make it non, non generic. Right? Nice. I, um, I was not expecting that. I mean, to me, like it's music discovery and music monetization is all about curation. Like you've got to know what an totally. audience wants. And so that there's a layer of curation here is super interesting. That's where your um, machine learning is going to have to go next because as this thing grows, humans aren't going to be able to do it all. <laughs> oh, believe me. It's a, it's an ongoing, it's, it's a very ongoing uh, conversation internally as to where, yeah, where we draw that line. But because look, people react and you know, we've had this forever. Like we have this little thing at the bottom of the site that says, here's how much music we've made. And here's how much music we think is out in the world. And here's what the percentage, you know, would be. It's, it was pretty simple. We, I wrote it in five minutes, didn't really think too much about it, but I think people sometimes look at the fact that 13, probably close to 14 million songs have been created on Boomi and they're like, they think that we've released 13 million or 14 million songs, uh, which is, which is not the case, which is certainly not the case. Um, it would be, it, it, yeah, we're, we're, we are, we are doing some curation. And again, when, when you've got 10,000 users, it's a different situation than when you have, you know, millions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and this is a really interesting point and conversation, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't think it's settled, right? right. What, what is going to go up? What isn't going to go up? We're kind of making up our own rules right now. We're engaged with, you know, DSPs to try to figure out how much content do you want and how should we figure out how to work towards, uh, you know, a hundred million song future. But if Boomi's the only place that you can listen to the song or share the song, you're going to stay on Boomi. So that's another another thought. Yeah, that's true too. There's you got to find the right balance uh, in terms of amplification versus keeping people in the ecosystem. Hey man, I haven't even asked my first question, I don't think, and it's time to take a break. I want to ask you about the uh, Boomy business model when we get back. We'll be right back. Hey, Dimitri here, just interrupting this episode because I have a little segment that I want to share with you from someone that I met at NAM. Among many other uh, interviews that you've already heard here on the podcast, we talked to a company called InSounds with a Z, and I really thought they had a clever solution to background noise and cleaning up audio, recording from phones, and so forth. Let's go to that interview, and you can hear directly from their founder. Hi, this is Emil Weinbrown, I'm, and I'm the founder of InSounds. Okay, so for someone who's never heard of InSounds, what is InSounds? So InSounds is an AI-powered uh, audio enhancement uh, engine. Basically what it does, it listens to the environment, listens to everybody speaking, and regenerates the audio without the reverb, without noises, and uh, without any artifacts, and preserves the original tone of, of the speaker. So wait a minute, we're at NAMM, it's crazy here. It's so loud right now, I hear drums in the distance. Are you saying you could remove all that stuff? Yes, definitely. All right, let's, let's take a break here and send this over to InSounds, process it, and hear what it sounds like. Okay, we're back. I am still hearing the drums. Uh, are our listeners hearing the drums right now? They, they shouldn't be hearing anything but us in a perfect, perfect environment. Nothing, is, nothing should bother them. It's so loud here. There's crowds everywhere and so forth. Now, are they hearing me or what are they hearing right now? They, when you speak, they hear you. When I speak, they hear me. And other than that, they hear quite quiet. And uh, how do you do this? Uh, so basically, um, with the emergence of AI, regenerative technology, regenerative means that uh, you can generate new stuff. So basically, what we do is listen to the incoming sound of a speaker understand his tone of voice, understand what he's saying, and re-speak that kind of fake audio, but very, very close to what's, the, what's being said. So the idea is that you regenerate the, the audio perfectly, as perfectly as you as possibly, 
and you uh, fill out the missing gaps, which are missing frequencies, noisy, noisy frequency, or whatever artifact out there. So we're filling out the gaps. Got it. So first you're, you're reading the signal of our voices. You're focusing on, on the voices. You're removing all this other loud background noise. It doesn't count as a voice, so it's getting removed. And then you're regenerating our voices. So it's actually kind of the AI that sounds just like me. Exactly. That's an AI copycatting you. That is exactly it. That is crazy. What are the use cases for this? How do you expect people are going to use this? So we're about to release a direct-to-consumer product where anyone, anywhere can record himself. Let's say uh, you can go to, with your friend to a coffee shop, have a great uh, conversation, and just upload it as a post podcast with, uh, as if it was recorded in a studio quality. You can, if, you, if you're a singer and you have an idea and you're in the elevator, you can sing, send your producer, uh, publish it directly to your social, and everyone, everybody will think you'll, you, you've made it in a, in a studio. So that's where we come in. It sounds that good, huh? That you, it actually sounds like you recorded in a soundproof studio with a great microphone. Yes, that is correct. That is, that is the vision. So what we want to do, our understanding is microphones are not enough. You need to have a brain to process what comes out of microphones so it will be perfect. Human ears are connected to our brain. There's a reason. The, the signal is not good enough in sound. You need some heavy processing in order to make it really good. So in sounds is the brain between the ear of the cheap uh, microphone or the iPhone microphone before the output. Yeah, before it gets out to the world, before it gets to the social media, to any application and so forth. I could see this also being used for like uh, distortion on the, on the voice itself too. Are you able to clean up the sound of the voice too? Yes, yes. Uh, there's a fine limit where we want to preserve authenticity. We oh, don't yeah. want to change it because it, it it switches to a different domain which we don't want to don't want to touch but it's uh we want to stay true to our clients we want to reconstruct their exact voice make it uh, perfect by the way in terms of distortion if you have a clip signal if you have a quantized signal uh our ai removes that it doesn't care about it that's the part i'm curious about as a podcaster yeah yeah so we actually remove clippings and distortions that's that's kind of a part of the deal. So let's let's turn off the in sound so people can hear that we really are still sitting here in this loud environment. So I know you have a very strong uh, technical background, unrelated fields, um, and uh, I'm curious, what was the moment where this idea for this product came to you? So I'm a passionate technologist. I have a background in physics, uh, electronics, coding, AI. I've done it all, I love it. And that's where things came, came together to me. I want to help people create content. And I think I, we can, InSounds can do it amazingly good. Got it. So InSounds, it's I-N-S-O-U-N-D-Z. The last letter is Z. Is it InSounds.com? Yes, that is correct. You can uh, log in and check out our products. You can try out our uh, processing engine. You can drag and drop your audio file. And uh, you can also uh, shoot an email and uh, we'll get back to you. Right now we have a, a business to business product. We're about to ship the business to direct to consumer product. So you can check it out and uh, we'd love to, uh, to see you. Awesome, thanks so much for joining Music Tectonics. Amazing, that was fun. I hope you enjoy hearing from more of these innovators that we met at NAMM and other music industry conferences. Let's get back to the show. Okay, I'm having too much fun because uh, <laughs> I've got a long list of questions I haven't even gotten to yet, Alex, because the conversation is just great. Let's get into the Boomi business model. Why don't you just tell us how it works? Uh, yeah, sure. So, so we, we take rights on the content, right, that, that we're, we're co-creating uh, with the people on our platform. Um, and we, we exploit those rights as any other rights holder would. Uh, we take a cut of, of distribution. Uh, we actively see commercial opportunities. And we are using this to, to develop a catalog. And I think that's where we've started, right? Um, where we're going. Uh, and, and again, I, I, I think the theme of this conversation is what happens when you have millions of users. The, the thing we want people doing is coming to Boomi, being creative, you know, finding their own artistry. This is happening thousands of times, like as we're speaking right mm -hmm. now, which is the crazy thing, right? And 
you know, when we looked at our user base and what they wanted to do, they want to put it on Spotify. That's just where they listed the music, right? So we so we built that function for them. I think as our our you know, as our technology has developed, um, as more people have become interested in this, there is a whole range of commercial use cases that people are asking us for, right? Um, this is everything from easy stuff, music to pot, you know, music for podcasts, music for games, etc., um, to education use cases, to like cute, you know big, big artists, right. Who, who sometimes don't want people knowing that there's booming in their song, but, but big major, you know, artists, uh, who are using this in the studio, who are getting inspired by this stuff in the studio. Um, and so a lot of the changes that, that we're, we're making and may, may actually be up by the time this, this, uh, podcast goes live, um, or, or will be starting to get rolled out by the time this goes live, uh, is, is being much clearer about that, right? Because the fact that we're taking rights, you know, complicates it if you want to use it in a video, if you want to put it in a film, right? And so that's been a, a manual, hi, can I use this for, for this purpose? Um, we have, it, it's, and, and that has been uh, hard to manage. And so we're rolling out a, a much clearer set of licensing standards. You'll be able to, to you know, pay us on the platform um, for a whole bunch of different use cases. And, that's going to be, you know, a big part of the strategy going forward that we we haven't really focused on in the past, uh, because there's tons of people who want this for, uh, you know, let's let's call it functional purposes, mm. right? And that's not music that necessarily we want to have in a catalog or put out on DSPs, uh, but it's something that you know serves a, a particular value, um, you know, to to like I said, everything from individual creators to big agencies to uh, anybody you can think of that might want music in, in a thing. Um, and so that's really where the business is going. I think when you're talking about functional uses, are you saying like somebody might want to make some music to meditate or sleep to that has nothing to do with a commercial use? Is that what you mean? Uh, no, I, I more mean that you've got a podcast, you had music in the beginning of it. Yeah. There's a lot of people with a lot of podcasts Yeah, and you can go, so commercially, you functional, know, I see. try to figure out how to, how to license a song, or you could go to some sort of confusing, you know, uh, portal and you don't really understand the license, or you can go into Boomi and make a song and there right. it is, right. You can customize it. You can get to where you need to be. And we, we have traditionally not really been in, I, I guess, focused on that, that area. Um, we really care about the creative. We really care about turning non-musicians into musicians. Hmm. Um, some people don't want to be musicians. Uh, and this is just what we're learning from, you know, the, the huge number of people signing up. Uh, so I think there's a, there's a, a massive untapped opportunity for us there, uh, as well as, as the catalog business. And I think those are going to grow in parallel. Yeah. Interesting. You know, I have to say before I actually used it, um, I, I read the terms and I was like, wow, Boomi owns the copyright. And I can kind of revenue share monetize in the current model. I hear you're building other models too. Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, I, and I thought, what the fuck? Like, Boomy's taking the rights. And then I played with it and made what I thought sounded good. I don't think Alex liked it, guys. Um, but it didn't really <laughs> take me very much effort. I'm not here to judge. <laughs> and I felt like Boomy kind of deserves the copyright. I didn't know I was going to have that emotional reaction. I was sort of like, I did something and I know that I could do more if I spent more time with it. But like, the kernels of all the sounds, including the rhythm and the melody and the arrangements and the effects and the mixing. It didn't come from me. It didn't come from me. So I like it was it, doing it myself made me kind of have like a shift in my head of sort of like, oh, yeah, I get why these companies are holding the copyright. It came from them. What does it mean for Boomi to own the copyright, though? And, and what kind of responses are you getting from users versus the music industry or longtime artists? Well, sure. I mean, there, there are some really, really good reasons to own rights for, for something like this. I think there are two that are very basic and, and for the, the, you know, uh, new entrance into the space, I would really th think about this stuff where, you know, like I said, in the same way that we're not going to let every release out, you know, part of that and part of that infrastructure is that if they, if you, you can make, really, really fun, really great, exciting, positive content on Boomi. You can also make it's it's you can make anything you want and you can make really bad stuff. Yeah. Right. Or you can come in with a bad intent. And we recognized very early on that if you had a malicious intent, right, um, let's say just think of a horrible subject, whatever the worst possible thing in the world is to you. And now think about the fact that you could make a song about that in you know, you said 10 minutes or five minutes, right? 
or even faster. Um, wait till you see what we're going to launch around vocals. Like, and, and, and you'll be able to create, right? Oh, I can guess now. You I can, can already guess. create more <laughs> offensive, more offensive content in the span of an hour than like <laughs> a record labels, you know, entire output for the year. And so we are that, that if that's going to happen, right. We need control and we need to be able to control that. That was an early decision here mm, yeah. and not something we're ever going to budge on. It's, it's something where if there's something that is, is really offensive or really counter to our values. And of course we've seen this right in the course of the, the people coming through, um, and, and we, we reject it. Well, that person can just, you know, rip it down or record it or, or do something unauthorized with it. Right. And try to release it themselves or go somewhere else with it or, or, you know, put it in their content anyway, without permission. And so we said, look, if we're going to be creating millions, and millions of songs here, right. Um, then we need, we need a system of, of, of control. And so by taking rights, right. Uh, it allows us to, to ha have some control over that. Right. Um, and, and to be clear, we take rights by default, but we, we, like I just mentioned, we give them away all the time. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, we, we sell them, we, we give them away for free, you know, in the, in education, um, there's a ton of educators using Boomi, right. This has been a massive, uh, uh, user base for us. And you know, if in cases where they're broadcasting it or in cases where they like need to clear the rights, like I said, that's been a very one-on-one -on -one conversation, <laughs> um, uh, up until now. And we're about to, to productize a lot of that. Um, but that's that's sort of thing one, um, and thing two is you know to the extent that we're we're using uh, your you know activity or your rejections or you're saying like no I don't like that song uh, to train our own models in a universe where you're owning you know the the song, um, we would need to seek permission from you hmm. right to wow. to use that to improve our own <laughs> system. In, in fact, you can maybe even sue us right. So so there, there's a lot of considerations. Um, if what you're doing is coming at this the way we came at it, which is with a with a basic respect for copyright and a basic respect for copyright law, um, that says, look, if if you know the, the rights have to go somewhere, um, let's you know we'll claim it by default. Uh, and if you need it for something, you know, before it was come talk to us. Now there's too many people, so you'll be able to click a few buttons and find the license that you need. Um, but you know, if if you are if you have malicious intent. Uh, we're still going to be able to, you know, re retain some, some control over that. We, we understand that there's the potential for, uh, you know, um, a, a lot of content to come out about stuff that we don't like. And so we want to have a mechanism to control that. It, it doesn't apply in 98% of cases, um, but it, but it does in some, then there's the other side, which is that, you know, 85%, I bet if we re-ran re the survey it would be higher, but 85% the last time we ran a survey of our users, it's the first time they've ever made music, right? Mm -hmm. And around 30%, it's the only way they make music. So they're, the, your average person off the street, if the thing that we believe is that, not that AI creates music, but they, AI creates musicians. And I would push back on some of your, your sub, uh, uh, some of what you said about, you know, why well, I feel like I didn't make it. Listen to what you roll back the tape from six minutes ago. You made a bunch of decisions there, mm -hmm. right? Um, there was a lot of humanity uh, on both sides of that song. And most people aren't going to want to say, well, all right, I'm putting this, I, I have this song. I'm going to go look up what a distributor is. I'm going to go register, you know, an ASCAP IPI number. And I'm going to make, you know, pick a just like you and I know all of this stuff that you just have to know in order to monetize the music, uh, we have built a lot of tech that streamlines all of that stuff. And all you have to do is, is put it out through our label and you get paid. And mm -hmm. so we made it really, really simple for the vast majority of our users, uh, instead of them, you know, not realizing that they can monetize, um, or trying to figure out how to navigate the insanely confusing world of rights management, uh, on their own. Well, I'm going to play another little piece that I made there um, because I knew we would be top talking about this. And I did record some vocals. I didn't even plug a microphone into my computer. I just oh straight, straight from my laptop. Oh. Um, I don't know if this will make it through the curation. <laughs> folks or not, but... <laughs> Is that saying copyright over and over again? Where did you, where did you get that? That's my voice. And then that's oh that's you. Okay, that's my you. voice. Oh, and you applied the voice filters to it. And then your voice filters made them sound cool. So, Alex, isn't there some recent U.S. Copyright Office conversation about how AI 
itself cannot hold oh, yeah. copyright that it it has to be humans and if that I, i'm not sure it's done like if that's passed or what established but if that does come to pass how will that impact your terms of service and your business model yeah yeah i mean i'll i'll express a non-consensus view here um not to get too controversial i think the copyright office is doing a great job <laughs> i don't think anybody said that <laughs> recently nice i think they're doing a really i actually think that they're you, you know be, because this is this is an unprecedented and and very difficult area um and i think some people forget sometimes that the copyright office can't make laws right all they can all they're doing is just trying to interpret how to apply uh the existing principles right to a emerging set of of novel creative cases and if you look at the law, it's pretty obvious that you need to, it needs to be made by a person in order to, to be granted copyright. Right. Um, and the, the idea, like the very idea of AI owning a copyright is like fun from a legal theory perspective. Right. Uh, and, and that case, um, I think case you're talking about, you know, is one that I think is more designed to like test constitutional boundaries, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Than it is to actually say like, I want to copyright this image. Um, there is some new guidance, right? There is some new guidance that it w did frustrate some people because the guidance was it's going to be case by case, right? Um, but it reiterated some some principles um, that that I'm I'm actually in in full agreement with that I think makes makes a ton of sense. Um, and what that is is that if if you have a human in the loop, so to speak. Uh, you can you can copyright that, and if you don't, right, then you you probably can't. And whether or not a human was involved is going to be, and I think should be, uh, a really important principle for applying copyright uh, in in the future. And it, it doesn't impact our terms or, or the way we think about it at all, because as as much as people want to apply the label of AI generated or say like or maybe group all AI things together, right, into one lump, um, one scary lump, <laughs> uh, which is kind of how I think people are thinking about it right now. Uh, the more they'll lose the context, right, because they're not listening to this podcast, of the fact that you've got human, uh, you know, I would take the position that probably every single one of those 13 million songs was created by a person, right, had a human in the loop, um, both in terms of the decisions that you're making and the edits that you're making to it, um, as well as the decisions that we and our team of songwriters and our team of uh, and our music team are are making on the other side, right? So you've got humans on both sides of, of what we do. There is no spontaneous AI that decides one day to print a whole bunch of songs, and um, uh, that's that's just not how it works. I mean, I, I really believe that there are. Um, I mean, the, the, there is no functional difference, right, between a song that you've created, you know, with Boomi. Uh, edited, added your voice to, added your creativity to, and then put out, I think the question when it comes to us is, well, why wouldn't that be copyrightable, right? Not why would it? I, the recent guidance, I think, is more about these much more automated systems that take in copyrighted training data, uh, you know, reproduce, let's call it, you know, hallucinations, right, based on, based on these prompts coming in. Um, and if you've it, there, there seems to be some some guidance that if there was no human in that loop or very, very little human, um, uh, you know, participation in the creation of that media, then it might call into question, right, some of that copyright, and they're going to try to figure it out on a case by case basis. Uh, I, I don't know what else people are expecting at this point, right? I think they're doing a great job, and I think they're doing the best that they can do. I appreciate that perspective. It's nice to hear, nice to hear, especially coming from you, given what you're building here. But just to be clear, do you, are you the human that owns the copyright to the songs that I played on this podcast that I built in Boomi? Because I, I don't own them. Or, uh, I mean, what you're kind of saying is I'm the human that makes it human created or human collaborative. And so a copyright is merited, but I'm not the same human <laughs> as the copyright, right? Just to be clear. <laughs> From a purely technical law perspective, that's the way it. Ha I mean, that's just the way it has to work today, Got right? It. The the analogy would be would be like this. Um, you know, let's say I built a studio and it's a beautiful world class studio, and I've spent you know millions and millions of dollars on a, on amazing equipment. And you show up to my studio one day and I say, um, okay, here's the deal: you can use all this for free, everything in here. You know, record your heart out as long as you want. On your way out, 
in exchange for giving you that for free, right? Um, I want to, you know, I'm going to manage your copyrights and cut you into a revenue share, right? That's basically what's happening here. If it sounds like we've invented something totally new, we haven't. That's just how record labels and publishers work. Um, we've taken uh, we've taken those principles and we've we've added uh, sort of a generative element to it. Um, and so it, you have the right, you know, as a person to to grant your to, to grant your rights or grant a copyright uh, to a company or to to another individual. Um, and look, it, it, I wish we lived in a simpler world where. We could grant you that copyright by default and not worry about whatever you're going to do with it. Um, we don't live in a simple world. And so if as sort of roundabout as it is, um, taking the position of, look, OK, we, we own it again by default. But if you need it for something, if you want to play play it on your podcast, right? Yeah, well, we're going to clear that. We'll give you permission for that. Um, so so that's just how it kind of okay. has to work today. Yeah, yeah. just want to uh, make sure we were clear about the human, which which part which role the various humans were, well, well, were playing. As it pertains to copyrightability, right? I, I think there's a series of arguments, right? Sort of on both sides. And that, that's why I'm saying there's there's humans on both sides of, of this um of this equation. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's what I think is important and what what we're not gonna lose. Cool. You mentioned training, uh, training data before. One, one of that's one of the other controversial things about generative music is the sure. training material. What training material does did Boomi use, or does Boomi use to train your AI to make these speedily composed original tracks that I humanly made some selections around? <laughs> there we go. See how fast you get from AI generated to actually this is just regular music made by a person. Um, the <laughs> uh, well, but look, I, I think. Um, Without, without doing an hour on it, um, <laughs> I think the important part is that we are not training on copyrighted training data, right? Mm -hmm. And we never have. To the extent that we're training models, it's on, uh, you know, the, the things that we've, we've generated before. And there's a lot of different ways to, to create music, right? Um, it's, it's, as a musician, it's sort of a weird thing to say this, but it, it, you can look at as a, look at music as a statistics problem, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, and there are a lot of different ways to solve a statistics problem. You can use machine learning to solve that problem. You can also use a whole a lot of other <laughs> methodologies to solve that problem, right? And I would put us more on the scale. If the scale goes from like Brian Eno to stable diffusion, we are more on the Brian Ito side of that equation, right? Using a generative principle. Like there's this thing that generative music meant like mm. in, in sort of music history um, that's being applied to a lot of new things now, right? There's new language kind of developing around this stuff. Um, but we were taking these, these sort of generative statistical principles, we're, we're putting them out. And if you'll notice, right, there's, there's two things you do after you generate a Boomi song, you save or you reject. And so as, you know, as we've been able to collect data, as we've been able to see, uh, you know, some of these trends, uh, we can drive improvements uh, in, in our own system and create stuff uh, out of our own, but in, a, in an environment where, again, you mentioned, we've been talking a lot about copyright, where we, we know we own all that data, right? So for any given song, and by the way, uh, not, not to toot our own horn too loudly, but that also makes it really easy to license. Um, you, as you know, from our peers in the industry, licensing music can be very complicated, very expensive, very annoying. You haven't cleared all the publishing. You haven't cleared, you know, X, Y, and Z. Um, and you put something out and you realize you didn't pay enough for it, right? So it, the, the current way that licensing works, um, if, if you look at a Boomi song, we can show you exactly how it got made, when it got made, who made it. Um, we have all, you know, all of the data about that. And it's probably the cleanest, cleanest easiest catalog ever. Wow to monetize or, or, or to, to use in your stuff. Right. Um, so I think again, we, without doing an hour on it, the important thing here is that we are not using copyrighted training material, uh, to, to create these systems. Um, we've, we've done some clever stuff in the background to figure out how to above all respect copyright and make sure our human created catalog, um, complies, uh, with, with all the current and past thinking. Man, in that area. Alex, as you're as you were talking about that, I mean, first the fact that you didn't train on outside data that you guys used your own models to create the fir the original kernels, and then your generative models are basing off of the uses of people who have engaged with your terms of service, um, 
it it reminds me of a couple things. One of this is this concept concept of anti fragility. Like the worse the song gets, the better the song gets in a way because you get this human feedback, um, which is super interesting. But I'm also picturing like this fractal model of of um, of improvement, but also of business model because what you're actually saying is you can also very easily license your catalog of music to AI companies to train their data without them having a really difficult time. <laughs> so I'm picturing no, like this. <laughs> no specific comment on that, but but it's an interesting thought. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, well, in that case, I was going to ask you what you think the licensing model should be for AI training reference material, but clearly you right. kind of sidestepped the whole issue by not having the problem. Well, let, let me let me let me caveat that. Okay. I would love to. I would love to. I and and I I want to be clear about our motivations here, right? It's not just about giving the users a really fun and amazing experience. It's also about making sure that in a universe of, you know, hundreds of millions of songs per day, which is a thing I've been saying for a long time, as you know, and that everybody thought I was insane about until about eight minutes ago. <laughs> um, it's, it seems. You're welcome. Um, I think the licensing model should follow traditional principles so that any of those artists get paid. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, th I think it like starts so simple. If you're a musician and you have created a song and that song is ingested into a, a AI training system and that AI training system has the potential to write a song that's very similar to what I just put in it, I should get paid, right? So let's start there. You should get paid for that thing. How do you get paid for that thing? What is the mechanism? What is the, what is the share, right? Um, my view would be that I think an ownership split um, makes sense, but is very complicated to impossible in practice. If you actually think about what it would take to try to figure out what pieces of this output came, it's not really how any of this works because it's making a sort of statistical uh, assumption rather than like a copy of the data. So that's still so, sort of very unclear. Um, so in lieu of an ownership model, I think you, you got to go to rev share. And if you're going to go to rev share, you know, you, you could take in things like um, a, a percentage of the market. You could take in things like explicit opt-ins from artists. I think this is going to take a while to figure out personally. Um, there are some very real concerns I think from artists, I think from rights holders about not just what does it take to license for, for AI training, but can you license it? What about name and likeness rights? What about deep fake vocals, right? We've, we're seeing that in the press every couple of weeks now. Um, so there's some real, real questions there. And, you know, there, there may be others who go forward with, with non-compliant or slightly compliant, you know, um, novel legal theories, right? we're not going to do that. We're going to stick to our principles of saying we, we, I, I you know, I've, I've repeated our principles here. We respect copyright. We want humans in the loop. These are original songs. Um, and we're not going to train on anybody's data that we don't have permission for. And so I, I would want to, you know, I, I really, like I said, I really want to, I think it makes sense to provide it for, as from a user experience perspective, I also think it provides a mechanism uh, to allay some of the fears, right, that we're hearing all the time um, with money, with a big pile of money. Um, <laughs> there's uh, the, the artists who were recording in the 60s didn't, you know, create their music for a streaming service, but they're on a streaming service now, right? Um, and the streaming service didn't get that for free. They got to pay for that. So I think those are, are going to come together. There's a lot of discussion about it. Um, we're in, we're, you know, involved in, in a lot of these discussions and I think we're going to see something happen, but I think it's going to take some time. I think it's going to take some time and, and you got to pay the artists in the model. I mean, I, it's, it's nonsensical to me to say that you don't. All right. We got to take one more quick break. And when we come back, we have some important questions to ask you about where this is all going. How, how, how big is Boomy going to get and what's that going to do? We'll be right back. Hey, it's Shaylee here. Huge news. Music Tectonics conference badges are on sale now at musictectonics.com. 
If you act now, you can grab one of our super limited, super early bird rate badges. It's the best price for the best music tech event of the year. Your badge unlocks three amazing days of connecting with music tech innovators in Santa Monica, California, October 24th to 26th. We're busy planning high energy panels, insightful keynotes, a startup pitch competition, innovative exhibitors, networking, and more. What? You're not already ready to buy your badge? Then sign up for our mailing list to get updated on programming, speakers, and exclusive discounts. It's all at musictectonics.com. Now back to the show. All right. Well, we've uh, been going through all sorts of different lenses of talking about generative music and boomy. Um, you know, just to be clear, now that I've made these songs, I, I'll have to get through your curation team. But in theory, I can upgrade to a premium <laughs> subscription and release the music on DSPs like Spotify. We said I get to keep a percentage. I think it's 80 percent. You keep 20 percent. You own the copyright, which helps us handle all the business of it and the controls to figure out licensing. And so it doesn't get taken down and all the stuff that I might not do on my own. How much traction are you getting on the, those paid and monetization features? And how big is Boomy going to get as a result to as a rights holder on these tracks? I mean, we call it Boomy for a reason, <laughs> right? Um, which I can't believe nobody had that name. Oh, yeah, right? that's a great what, find. Like, <laughs> What a name, right? How did how did no Just one have that? It's a musical guys. term. It's a production term. It's a it's a you know it's a boomy market. It's a it's a boomy base. Um, I, I mean, look the, the the traction. I spoke to the traction earlier. It is incredible. I mean, you're, you're talking about million. This is a TAM machine. I mean, a, in, in terms of like the addressable market for people who want to express themselves in music, right? Um, I I. I I think we are we are so so early so early in it, like it's a hard question to ask it's a question I get all the time how big how big can this be right usually get it from VCs the and what I'm saying is like probably some function on the number of people who have iPhone cameras is my guess because it, it's sort of like asking the question well how many photographers are there going to be to somebody in in the 1940 mm -hmm. you're like I don't know probably two in every town makes sense. <laughs> Well, now you've got, right? Because for, for the market of them, that, that's kind of, <laughs> right. Um, and so now we've got one in every pocket. Yeah. And, I, and that's where just music has been trending forever and, and where it's going to go. Um, how big Boomy gets as, you know, as a rights holder um, in, in that universe is going to be a function of that TAM, of, of like how many people on the planet Earth uh, want to express themselves with music, how many people want to do that with Boomy, how many people are, you know, okay, I guess, with, with our, our splits and, and the way we work as, as a record label um, and as a publisher. And I, I think that number is probably pretty big. Y you know, we, we talked a little bit before about, uh, you know, why, why I'm doing this, right, mm -hmm. where, where this came from. It wasn't just my own fear as, as a musician. Music tech is a tough space. And the listeners of this podcast who have been involved with startups and, and who know this space well, uh, every, we'll all nod when they're like, yeah, this is a hard thing to do. Our view is if we're going to do something in music tech, we want to do the biggest thing in music tech. Mm. We want to, we want to really kind of get at what does it take to build a really significant company? And if you're, and the thing that usually prevents that is, is rights. You normally you have to rely on somebody else's rights. Um, but if we're rethinking what it, you know, what it means, uh, to be a music creator in some of these cases, then we get to, you know, explore everything that could come out um, of having a large, large pile of rights. So if you wanted to create, if, if you wanted to create a streaming service today, well, we're probably easier to license than most of the, most of the uh, other music out there. If you want to, you know, take your song because you're a great musician and take it off of Boomy and stem it out and make a hit, then great, because that is happening, right? Uh, that's happening every day. So how big we're going to get Again, I, I really just think is a function of how many people in the universe have internet connected devices and want to express themselves with music. And I think that is in the billions. So one of the things that, and, and the reason why we have that counter at the bottom, and we'll probably always have it because believe me, it's caused, it's like, we're always like, is this going to scare people? Is this freaking people out? It was not, we didn't really think that hard about it. It was just, here's how many songs are getting made. Um, but what, what I really hope listeners can take away from this 
is that 13 million songs is a small number, not a big number. This we we count. I really think of our company's development in terms of 100 million song blocks. Like we're 13% of the way through the first 100 million. And what that means is there's going to be um, some of this stuff, right? Some of this, some of what we're talking about copyright, some of what we're talking about uh, in terms of curation and what is going to leave the platform, what's going to stay on the platform. All of these questions are, are very much in flux, right? Um, that's a little chaotic, but but pretty, pretty interesting and pretty exciting. Um, so I think we're going to get pretty big and I think we're already pretty big. Um, if all you're thinking about is the current state of, of music, but I think if you look 20 years out, 30 years out in this industry, this is, these are small numbers. These are not, this is not that many people, you know, a few million users is not that many users. If there's a billion and a half people, 2 billion people on planet earth who would be interested and inspired to create music if they could, um, and most people cannot, and the reasons why they can't are usually economic, are usually access to education. You know, what, what I love to see, you know, especially from our users in places like Turkey, right, or places where, you know, we've never advertised, but some YouTuber made something, and now we've got all these users from this, this territory, where we, we literally have people writing it, thank you for making this product, thank you for making it free. I have no way of make. I love EDM music, but I have no way of making that where I live and you know, they, they can't use even garage band. They can't use, uh, they don't have devices that can power, you know, music making, uh, to, to the degree that you and I are familiar with in, in more traditional ways. Um, and so th those are the stories, right? And that's, that's the untapped market here. And what else does that do? It makes you interested in music. If you see yourself on Spotify, well, probably you're going to subscribe to Spotify now, right? Probably you're going to care a little bit more about the other mm. artists. You're going to get more involved uh, in the way that, you know, I, I think that we, that traditional, um, you know, long tail or traditional indie artists do. We need people caring about music, right? And I think there is no better way to get somebody to care about it uh, than making it. And that's how we get big. We get big with the hearts and minds of the people who want to create all over the world, um, and that is that, that, I mean, that's it. And I think that's a huge number. I think it's billions of people and billions of songs. Wow. Well, this has been great, Alex. So fun to get back with you on the podcast after your 2019 appearance at the conference and to see what you've done in the last uh, few years, um, to be able to play with it myself. I'm looking forward to continuing to keep track of what you do. Love to have you on the podcast and, uh, hear everything you had to share. Thanks so much for joining. Anytime, anytime, Dimitri. Thanks for listening to Music Tectonics. If you like what you hear, please subscribe on your favorite podcast app. We have new episodes for you every week. Did you know we do free monthly online events that you, our lovely podcast listeners, can join? Find out more at musictectonics.com. And while you're there, look for the latest about our annual conference and sign up for our newsletter to get updates. Everything we do explores the seismic shifts that shake up music and technology, the way the Earth's tectonic plates cause quakes and make mountains. Connect with Music Tectonics on Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. That's my favorite platform. Connect with me, Dimitri Vitsa, if you can spell it. We'll be back again next week, if not sooner. You're listening to Music Tectonics.